Thank you. I haven't seen one of those before. Neither have I. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rena Sisson, Executive Director of the Berrien County Historical Association, and we welcome you to our second Saturday afternoon at the Courthouse Square American Justice Series. This four-part series is exploring how the average individual has helped change the law to better their communities. This month, Dr. David Benack of Western Michigan University will be joining us to discuss environmental law and the history surrounding modern environmentalism, thanks to the grassroots efforts of the average individual. Um, just a few notes before we begin. Um, number one, we have several other uh, events coming up here at the museum. And even though we're coming to the end of May, we're not quite done yet. This Friday is our very first pruning at the Courthouse musical series. Our May performer is Mike O'Mara, who will be performing on, for us here on the Jailhouse Plaza. Begins at 6.30 and there will be concessions for sale. Tickets are $5 for the public, $2 for BCHA members. And you're more than welcome to purchase a membership at the gate and apply that membership immediately to get the discount. Um, our next big thing, our next big exhibit is going to be uh, Batter Batter Swing, Southwest Michigan Baseball. That will open on Wednesday and run until July 18th and will feature memorabilia from our collections, the biggest little baseball museum out of Three Oaks, House of David, uh, City of David, as well as the Kalamazoo Growlers, the Battle Creek Bombers, and the West Michigan Whitecaps. I should know, I drove all over West Michigan collecting these items on Friday. <laughs> Just put it out there. Um, heading into June, we will have our first Mary's City of David tour on June 12th. That is currently sold out, but you are more than welcome to go on the wait list or check out one of the other tours a little bit later this summer. Visit bearinghistory.org or our Facebook page to learn more. Our next TNC talk is going to be uh, with Gary Gillette discussing the history, the history of baseball here in Southwest Michigan, including the three teams I have previously mentioned. Uh, we are also doing baseball trivia on June 19th, and tickets are available for that $5 per person or $40 per team. Uh, beginning in June, we will be going to in-person events. <laughs> David, you are one of our last Zoom guys uh, for the year, uh, but we will start going to in-person events. There are new policies available. Please visit bearinghistory.org to see our new COVID-19 policies. We are fully aware that things are changing minute to minute, so we try to keep as updated as possible. So uh, Dr. Benack is a, professor, a professor of history at Western Michigan University and also leads their public history department. And today he's going to talk about the role of modern, the role of grassroots movements in shaping modern environmental law. A lot of what we talk about in this series is about exploring how the laws have changed, going from maybe protecting a, a majority that may be hurting someone to protecting the minority who is being hurt. Um, environmental, modern environmental history is incredibly fascinating, and Dr. Benack will go into that a little bit more in his talk. But the role that the average citizen has played in environmental change has been significant and continues to be a huge part of the environmental movement today. In fact, much of what you learn today could be used to help push the environmental movement further here in Michigan through your own passions. Um, right now, at the point when we're recording this, we have nobody in our, um, in our room. Uh, but we do let everyone know that they're more than welcome to reach out to us if they have further questions regarding this. Um, if we do have people who join us a little bit later in this hour, then they will be free to ask their questions and we may have a Q&A at the end. Um, but information about how to contact us or Dr. Benack will be in the description of the YouTube page as soon as we get this edited and uploaded here uh, in a couple of weeks and you can reach out to learn more. Um, so I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Benack because it, this is his talk and not mine. So, sir, it is all you. Well, thank you for that really uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, and it sounds like you have some very nice exhibits and programs coming up. So uh, all of your patrons and guests should be really excited and should be paying close attention. So what I'm going to do today is kind of follow up uh, like what you'd said. What I want to look at, and so I want to state my area in history is mostly what we call modern history in the United States. So it's, it's post-World War II. Uh, so we're going to stay in that area because it's what I know the best. But we want to look at what, how laws have been shaped to help the environmental movement and how the environmental movement has been in turn shaped by those laws. And we'll start here by getting my screen up so you can see what I'm talking about. Let's 
let's see. I think that should do it. Is that sharing? Okay. All right. So it, and just to make sure, yeah. Okay, so we're good. This graphic you see that I'm using as the background for my slides is from the West Michigan Environmental Action Council. There is a newer version of that same entity that exists today. It's not the same version, uh, but they do carry through some of the other things. And that we'll, we'll come back to that graphic later and that will help it. And I'll, I'll tie it into what we're going. So when we talk about environmental change, I think it's important for us to have some concepts here. Uh, and one of the, the concepts I always like to start with is this idea of morality and ethics, because essentially when we're talking about environmental issues, what we're really talking about is determining what is in the best interests of the public. So we're, we're really looking to try to find what is the public good. And when we look at morals, ethicals, eth morals, ethics, and laws, all three of those are different ways that people can define right and wrong. And that's important for our discussion here because the law says that something is, is legal or illegal, but that doesn't necessarily line up with someone's personal morality or with the system of ethics that a group shares. So th those things are not necessarily in alignment. And we'll talk about how those, uh, how those complement and differ from one another in a little bit. And then the other thing to think about is really what we're trying to, to accomplish here is thinking about how you change things to accomplish a goal. And in order to cause that change, you need to have power. In our political system, power is held by people who can organize money or by people who can organize other people. That's how you create pressure on the political system. And we have this idea of law. In the United States, we have a, generally speaking, throughout our history, we've had a strong respect for law. But laws are created by people and people change and cultures change and ethics change over time. And that means that our interpretation of law and our determination of what is a good law changes. Oftentimes, it's not possible to change the law as society changes. And so the law is usually lagging behind social and cultural change. And in order to make the law change to catch up with where society or culture is, we often have to look at a conflict between where our ethics and where our laws are out of alignment. And when your ethics and your laws are out of alignment, how do you create that change to bring them back together? That's really what this is all about. Some of the ways that are available for people who want to see environmental protections put in place. One of the oldest traditions in the United States in terms of trying to create change uh, is the, the tradition of bearing witness. This is something that comes from the Quaker faith. Uh, it goes all the way back to the pre-revolutionary war and the abolitionist movement. Uh, the Quakers have a very long tradition of believing that observation creates change. Now, if you're uh, a, a science nerd, you know about the, the observer uh, uh, bias where, where, or the observer phenomenon where values can change just by watching something. And that's something that the Quakers definitely believed in. The other thing is direct action. Now, here's a quote from the King Center, but direct, direct action, this is really important in that it's, it's nonviolent, but it is actively taking an action to create a change. Uh, it's not trying to encourage someone else to make the change on your behalf. It's getting involved in making that change yourself. These all pull together 
And let's start to look at some of the places where we've seen these kinds of changes take place. One that I like to start with is air quality. Air quality has been debated in the United States pretty much since there has been a United States. You know, the earliest zoning ordinances in the United States emerged because of air quality contamination for the most part, some water, but mostly because of air. If you look around the United States, one of the things that you find is that uh, neighborhoods on the west side of communities almost uniformly across the United States are the wealthier parts of almost every single community. The reason for that is environmental, meteorological. It is the prevailing winds go from west to east. So that means that in colonial and early industrial America, the soot and the stench and all of the contaminants and dust and everything else that you didn't want to breathe blew from west to east and the people on the east side of the cities had to live through the contamination from the west side. With, or with industrialization really taking off, it was the smoke and the soot in the air that first mobilized people to take action. And we saw an example, a good example here uh, up in Grand Rapids. We've seen see examples down in Indianapolis. A lot of these things came out of the Midwest uh, and the East Coast because that's where, where industrialization was taking place. But the smoke abatement ordinances and these air quality rules were created because local people banded together uh, and said that they no longer wanted to live in a city where it was dark at noon. Uh, the image you see here at the bottom of this in St. Louis in 1939, that is actually taken at noon. And so you see how dark it was from the smog coming from uh, the smoke and soot uh, combining to create smog coming out of the smokestacks. This wasn't just a nuisance. This was also a life-threatening scenario. Uh, one of the most famous examples is from Denora, Pennsylvania, uh, where several people died because of an inversion which trapped this smog inside this mountain valley and ended up leaving several people dying from, from, the, from the contamination that was produced by this zinc uh, metalworks. People came together, they demonstrated, they uh, prevailed upon their city to take action. And then they stepped forward even further. And this is where we got the first Federal Air Pollution Control Act in 1955. It came directly out of this instance. So we have an Air Pollution Control Act that benefits the entire country that comes out of the situation of the Denora uh, example in particular, but you know, 50 years before that of constant agitation by people in communities across the United States who decided they no longer wanted to live where it was painful to walk outside and breathe the air. Take a quick break here, let people catch up if you're thinking about where this all fits together. We haven't gotten to World War II. I said that's where we're going to focus. And the reason we're going to focus on the post-World War II is because of a concept that's known as the Great Acceleration. Great Acceleration is, has become a relatively common concept in uh, history literature. What it essentially means is that the environmental problems that the United States faced or created, however you want to think about it, from the very first uh, European settlers that set foot in North America up until the end of World War II, those problems became increasingly severe. And the rate at which their severity increased became more uh, dramatic over time. But there was a fundamental shift with World War II. 
because of the type of new technologies and manufacturing processes that it instituted, but also because of the way that it reorganized capital and created a globalized capitalist system that made it much easier for capital to move around the world and made it easier for corporations to move their factories from place to place to take advantage of particular advantages. But the result was what was called the Great Acceleration because from World War II until today, the intensity of new and more dramatic environmental threats has increased at a rate well beyond what we've ever, what we've ever seen. And on top of that, it's posed an entirely new set of environmental concerns that we never considered before. I mean, just think about synthetic chemicals and plastic, plastics and toxics and, and radioactivity. None of that even existed before World War II. So it's not just accelerated, but it's, it's new environmental concerns. If we want to look specifically now at law and where does the law really tie into this? There's a lot of different things we can look at and we'll throw some more examples in here. That's what we're going to do uh, moving forward from this point. But we need to spend just a moment on what's called the Storm King case. The Storm King case was was brought by the Scenic Hudson Preservation Conference, which was a local environmental group. They were opposing a new dam that was gonna be called the Storm King Dam. They, proposed, they, they opposed it because it would have destroyed that particular uh, river valley and they, want, they didn't want that to, be, to go forward. This is a fundamental case because this is the first time where a, a, the Supreme Court says that the Scenic Hudson Preservation Conference has standing. And that's critical because up until this point, in order to have a case in court, you have to have standing and to have standing, you have to show that you are individually harmed or have suffered loss because of the, the, the issue that you're, you're raising in court. And with this case, with the Storm King case, the Supreme Court uh, determined that environmental organizations and nonprofit groups and community groups are harmed by environmental damages, which meant that they can bring cases to court and seek redress, which was huge because that makes the Sierra Club Legal Defense uh, Fund, the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, all of these organizations that are lawyers for the environment could not exist without the Storm King case giving them that precedent. Then of course we have what is you know, the most well-known uh, contaminant of the era, and that's DDT. You know, there's just so much material when it comes to DDT that, that there's different ways to take it. But I like to show how our culture has changed around this idea. And this gets back to that idea we started with, ethics and morals and laws. You know, what you see here is a community that wants to suppress illness. So they are spraying public beaches with clouds of DDT as, as kids are out there running around in it. Uh, you see over here this advertisement from Time Magazine, DDT is good for me, and all the different ways that you should be using DDT in your home because it does such amazing things. Well, you know, frankly, DDT was an amazing uh, chemical. It was yeah, it, the, the inventor of it won a Nobel Prize because this did seem like one of the largest advancements humanity had ever made in stamping out disease. It held promise for ending malaria. But that's 
part of what the great acceleration is about is about humanity leaping forward with our eyes closed. We didn't know exactly what DDT was going to do. Um, and there's, there's lots of documentation about all the tests that were run. And, and you, reading all the documentation, you have to believe it. Scientists, it, there's, this was not some pernicious uh, strategy to make profits at the expense of people's health, at least not in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, it was not. It was, you know, I always say with environmental history, the, the, the running theme is unintended and unanticipated consequences. Humanity thought we were doing something great by wiping out malaria. We did not realize that we were wiping out so much of the rest of the life on the planet in the process. And this is where the controversy comes in. And the controversy comes in when it becomes recognized that every place that you spray DDT, the birds die. And this is what put DDT on the, the agenda for Rachel Carson's writing and research. After studying the issue for uh, you know, about a decade, she decided to write this book, Rachel, uh, The Silent Spring. The book was not the first it, to point out the, the dangers of pesticides, but it was really the most well-written and well argued and it is often considered the beginning of the modern environmental movement because rachel carson decided to do this and remember this goes back to our everyday citizens she started this because everyday citizens wrote to her because they observed the death of birds following the spraying of ddt and they wanted somebody to do something about it so that's part of it it's if you see something say something and somebody can pick that up and take it farther this is where our logo comes in that we're using as our backdrop today. And it comes in because Michigan was one of the most important places in the path towards the banning of DDT. And it was, uh, it was one of the, it was a court case and it was, it originated in Berrien County. It originated in Berrien County because there was an outbreak of Japanese beetles. Uh, we still have problems with Japanese beetles. If you are watching this and you are a fruit grower, you know all about Japanese beetles and how much damage they can cause. Well, DDT will kill them just like everything else uh, that it kills. But it also has a whole host of problems that are caused by it being persistent and uh, a bioaccumulator and all these other things that, that people probably already know. Well, the Environmental Defense Fund wants to step in and they do step in and raise a case. And this isn't just a case of people from outside the state determining that they are going to dictate what is good for the environment of people in Michigan. This is such an obvious uh, environmental hazard that the Michigan Department of Conservation actually joins the Environmental Defense Fund in this lawsuit. I can't think of any, I'm sure there are others, but it, it is definitely at the very least very rare where one department of the government of Michigan is in a lawsuit against another department of the state of Michigan. So the Department of Conservation uh, is with the Environmental Defense Fund suing the Department of Agriculture in the state because of the, the poorly conceived plans to spray DDT and other uh, pesticides in the Barron County area. The case goes on um, and what ends up creating the kind of the, the what leads to the end is what happens in 1968, which is right afterwards. And that's when um, you can see the numbers here, 700,000 coho salmon in Michigan hatcheries die from being poisoned by DDT. The next year, the FDA seizes tens of thousands of pounds of frozen salmon in the state. These combine to convince the state of Michigan that we have to end the use of DDT. 
Uh, and the reason the state decides that is because the fishing industry, even in 1969, is worth $100 million a year to the state, and the state is doing everything it can to protect that. So, and that, you know, West Michigan Environmental Action Council is one of the local organizations that really works out of Berrien County to push that through from, uh, from a local residence perspective. So there's a whole bunch of different players in there, but it all uh, ties into the same set of issues. Sticking with DDT, we can look at the United Farm Workers. And if we want to think about people in the United States who have very little power, there are very few people in the United States who have less power than migrant farm workers. So the United Farm Workers organizes, or it, it forms through the work of Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, largely to organize uh, migrant farm workers. There are very, there's a, there's a variety of things that are on the agenda that are issues that cause United Farm Workers to organize. But one of the biggest is DDT. And that's why we're still on it. Uh, one of the problems with the, uh, the, the farm worker system in the 1960s and 1970s is what you see there in the top left, the, the unsanitary, very cramped, really kind of inhumane living conditions that were available for farm workers. Yeah, and in the, the, the world in which we live today, we know that if you want to create epidemic spread of disease, that is just about the perfect conditions. You get people who are paid poverty wages, so they don't have the, the financial resources for healthcare and uh, healthy food, and uh, they don't have... Uh, healthy lifestyles because of the conditions of their employment and their housing. And that means that disease is rampant and it's a immune compromised population because of the other lifestyle uh, factors that are encountered. Because disease is such a problem in these situations, the growers respond with a scheme to keep workers healthy. One of the ways that they decide to keep workers healthy is what you see in the top right. And that is in that sprayer, that is DDT. And this is happening in 1969, well after the publication of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. You know, I said when I started talking about DDT that I'm confident that the people who created DDT had the best of intentions. They did not know that there was, um, there are health problems that it would cause. By 1969, really no one has that excuse anymore. By this point, everyone knows that it is terribly dangerous. Uh, so it's the, the farm workers get sprayed with DDT uh, in their uh, living accommodations and they are sprayed while out in the field as crop dusters fly back and forth. And this becomes one of the major organizing issues for the United Farm Workers. So it's very much a grassroots, uh, common humanity issue, not driven by the rich and powerful, but by driven by people without power, but people who are willing to organize for their own health and for the health of their, their coworkers. Okay, this gets us into the 1970s pretty solidly here. Oh, and so I just, uh, let's pop back to that for a second. So DDT is banned in the United States in 1972. And it's important to say in the United States, uh, it's use in the United States. DDT is still produced in the United States. As a matter of fact, almost all of the DDT used on planet earth today is produced in the United States and shipped to other countries where it is used. Uh, and this becomes one of the kind of a, a theme that will that we will see in the 1970s. So the 1970s, 
is generally known amongst environmental historians as the Green Decade. And it's called the Green Decade because it is the decade in which the largest number of important environmental, uh, the, the largest number of important pieces of environmental legislation are passed. And they're signed into law by President Richard Nixon. Uh, Richard Nixon, you see a quote up here. I think that was from his second inaugural address uh, shortly before he resigned. Uh, but he is making statements that very clearly indicate that he cares deeply about the environment. Well, in reality, Richard Nixon was a very good politician other than, you know, he had this whole narcissism thing and he was a little bit paranoid and took things too far. But, you know, he was pretty good at understanding the political mind for the most part. And he knew that Americans wanted environmental change, wanted environmental reform. He didn't himself. So what we see is this is the power of organizing people. This is the way that new legislation is created. Uh, Richard Nixon, when he toured the Santa Barbara oil spill, which was the first major oil spill in the United States, uh, offshore oil spill, uh, he, you know, he was uh, upset by what he saw, but he wasn't willing to cancel any offshore oil leases. He didn't believe in environmental issues personally. Uh, John Ehrlichman was, was some top advisor. Uh, and as much as Ehrlichman tried to convince uh, Nixon that he should believe in the environment, Nixon just didn't. It wasn't something he cared about. Finally, his, his, uh, one of his environmental policy aides or his environmental policy aide was able to show Nixon that the data was there. Americans wanted to see environmental protections. And this comes out of Earth Day. Uh, Earth Day, 20 million people take, take, uh, take part in the first Earth Day. It is still the largest single day of action in United States history. The Black Lives Movement as a whole has organized more people into, um, into civil or into, into uh, civil disobedience and just into to direct action. But uh, not on a single day. The first Earth Day, Earth Day 1970, was the biggest individual day of action in U.S. history. 10,000 elementary schools, 2,000 colleges, 1,000 communities. It is every place across the country. And this is, these, these last couple numbers here, these last on the slide, really point out, are really are what made Nixon change his mind. Uh, in 1965, uh, only one third of Americans believed that pollution was serious. By 1967, half of America did. So it went from a third to half. Then by 1970, it had gone up to 70%. So from 1965 to 1970, a five year span, goes from about a third to over two thirds of the American people believe that pollution is one of the most important issues that the nation needed to address. That's a very rapid change. Uh, and then another pollution in ecology, something people in the United States didn't even know what ecology was in 1969. But by 1971, ecology is one of the most important issues for a quarter of all of the country. These are the things that pushed Nixon uh, because politicians, lawmakers are not leaders. Lawmakers are followers. It is the job of the American public to lead the lawmakers. And that's one of the things that we saw very clearly uh, with the effects of Earth Day. Now I want to talk about just a couple of examples to give you an idea of the breadth of ways that Americans have uh, engaged environmental issues uh, in with the law as a focal point as or as a an ancillary issue. One of my favorite is the bolt weevils. 
Now, this is one of my favorite because when you think about uh, civil disobedience, you think about uh, nonviolent direct action, you think about college kids, you think about hippies, you think about residents in cities. Probably not very many of us think about farmers first. And that's what the Bolt Weevils was about. The Bolt Weevils was a group of farmers who rose up in Minnesota uh, because they were protesting the condemnation of their land by a power company that was going to transmit power high, high, across high tension power lines across their land in order to, to do that they had to condemn the land, take it with eminent domain. And this causes farmers to begin to organize. Uh, and the, you know, they kick things off here with a farmer. The first thing that happens is, I think this was 75 when this first happened, farmer drives his tractor into a truck and partially runs it over to run a surveyor off of his land. It gives you an idea of what these farmers were doing. The farmers recognized that the surveyors were the kind of the, the ground troops, the advanced troops of the forces that were coming to take their land. So they did everything they could to get in the way. They put signs in the way, they would stand next to the surveyors and rev chainsaws. Uh, they pulled up the stakes, they dug ditches across the roads. I mean, they just did everything they could short of actually harming the, the, the surveyors themselves. This accelerates after the Supreme Court in Minnesota uh, has heard the case to try to protect these lands from eminent domain and the Supreme Court for the state of Minnesota decides in favor of the power companies. That causes the farmers to take things to the next step where they end up uh, cutting down one of these high tension power lines and get in a fight with some of the police who by this point have been uh, assigned to escort and protect the surveyors. This, as with violence in almost every situation, uh, creates more violence. Uh, the governor sends out a couple hundred state troopers who are there to intimidate the farmers. The protesters uh, escalate. This leads to larger and larger events with rallies and marches. One march, uh, and this is an image of it. I, I only know it was freezing weather, but looking at that, to me, it looks like it is well below freezing. But we have over 8,000 people marching 10 miles in that kind of cold in Minnesota in order to make a statement. Uh, there is a great deal of public support. The schools let out so that the teachers and the school kids can participate in actions. The Local radio stations are communicating or spreading information for the protesters. Uh, the, the bolt weevils start knocking down towers and shooting out insulators all over this development. Eventually, the farmers uh, are unable to essentially uh, uh, combat the level of force that the state is able to mobilize. When the National Guard comes in at the request of the Minnesota governor, eventually the farmers lose. Uh, and so part of that was to control over their land. The other thing was not the greatest science at the time, but it's something that was a great concern then. There was a concern that these high tension power lines would cause health effects from the radiation coming off the lines. Uh, that's generally been disproved today, but it is still something people can, are concerned about, and it is something that was an environmental health issue that hadn't been adequately addressed for the farmers and was something that they were was driving part of their resistance. I'm going to jump to a different part of the country with a little bit different type of a uh, concern, and 
talk about the West Virginia Highlands Conservancy. So this is a group that's a more traditional environmental group. It's in a kind of a not traditional environmental setting. It's in you know, West Virginia, but it is largely run by professionals and elites. Uh, and what they do is they set out to use the court system to stop the destruction of what they see as the wilderness or the, the highlands of West Virginia, as they call it. Uh, and they stop a couple of dams and they're really quite successful using the laws in their defense. They are the first people who challenge uh, mountaintop removal from the area. And they did that you know, just in the late nineties. Um, but you can see this is, and since they've been fighting mountaintop removal, they've gotten a lot more support. And this is a grassroots organization really now. It's, this is local people taking courts or taking large corporations, governments into court to try to get redress of their grievances, which is the way that the court systems are supposed to work in the United States. They're really designed to be a leveling institution where you're, no matter how wealthy or powerful you are, it's supposed to be the law rather than your wealth and power. As you know, we all know, that's not necessarily always the case, but this is one of the best tools that exists for environmental groups. Yeah. In, if we look at another one of these cases, and I'm just gonna do a little bit more here. Um, if you look at another one of these cases, one of the things that we see is another group of farmers. You know, farmers do have the cultural um, tradition of organizing. If you think to the Grange, or you think to, you know, the populists, you know, so that, a lot of grassroots organizing, the tradition of it, and really the tradition of progressivism itself comes from farmers in the United States, not from anywhere else. So farmers do have that culture and that tradition of organizing. And on the Northern Plains, you see that as well, just like you did down in West Virginia. And it's a lot of the same issues in the Northern Plains. And this is primarily in uh, Montana, but also in Wyoming. What happens here, is landowners in Montana in the 1970s become very concerned about their ability to maintain control of their land. Uh, just like the farmers in, um, in, in Minnesota with the bolt weevils. In Montana, in the Powder River Basin, it was an issue of coal mining. It's a little bit different in this particular case because the Powder River Basin contains most of the high value coal reserves in the United States today. And one of the things that we see, if you look at these two charts, and it's important to look at them together because this first one, this is just coal production. This is coal production from federal lands. If you look at the point at which federal lands uh, the production of coal in federal lands begins to increase rapidly. It is exactly the same place at which the production of coal from surface mines displaces the production of coal from underground mines. Uh, and it is a result of federal policy that makes that happen. And one of the results of all those different issues is that by the mid 1970s, almost all coal mining in the United States is done on public rather than on private land. And coal mining on public lands is almost done in these gigantic open pit coal mines, uh, these, these strip mines. The, and the, the, the farmers in Montana, Wyoming did not want their land seized for mines. And they did not want to worry about what those mines were going to do to their water supplies. So they pushed back. And they successfully pushed back 
to the point of getting the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act passed, which creates some safeguards for people um, from the contamination caused by mines. And if you look here, that victory was real, but it wasn't permanent. And one of the victories that comes out of that is this abandoned mine land reclamation fee. The 1977 Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act set that at 35 cents per ton of coal produced would be the fee that mining corporations would have to pay for a surface mine. If it was an underground mine, it was only 15 cents. In 2007, the federal government basically said, we are going to subsidize the production of coal in open pit mines. There is no way around it. That's exactly what it was. And you know, we can talk about Democrats and Republicans, uh, but this was a decision by a Democratic administration to you know, open up the floodgates for coal production. Uh, the result is a significant decrease. And then in 2013, in under a Republican administration, another significant increase that uh, has made it possible for surface mined coal to become much more um, much more profitable by taking that off. So it's essentially it's a subsidy. Let's talk about Love Canal and I think we might and after Love Canal uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just touch on Love Canal pretty quickly here, and then we'll move from that and get towards wrapping things up. So Love Canal is a story that most people who are likely to be watching this have heard about and uh, can see this. Uh, this is going to be recorded, so you'll be able to look at this timeline in detail. There's a whole lot on there. Uh, for our purposes, it's not as important because what I all I really want to do is paint the big picture. And the big picture here is that this area had been Love Canal, which was, a which was a partially dug canal that was supposed to be transportation around Niagara Falls. It is filled in by Hooker Chemical with 55 gallon drums full of toxic waste. At the time of dumping, the way that they were doing it was completely legal. They stopped before there was regulations that said that what they were doing was not legal. They left behind this, this pit that was partially covered of toxic waste. Uh, the city of Love Canal does one of the stupidest things in the history of humanity by building a school on top of that hazardous waste. Uh, even though Hooker Chemical Company did tell them not to because Hooker Chemical Company knew that it would be dangerous to do so. So we have a school and a neighborhood built on top of toxic waste dump. Uh, and you are probably all familiar with the freeze thaw cycle that you get that causes the field, the rocks in farmers fields to get pushed up to the surface every spring. The same thing happens with steel drums full of toxic waste in New York. So they eventually get pushed to the surface, they rupture, they rust, you've got black stinking ooze seeping into people's basements, all the vegetation on the school's playground dies, kids get chemical burns on the playground, on and on and on. The state and then the federal government refuse to offer any assistance. Uh, they refuse to acknowledge that there is any threat. Lois Gibbs, this woman here, decides to organize her neighbors. Her neighbors organize through letter writing campaigns, through citizen science campaigns, through public pressure campaigns, and even through some civil disobedience campaigns after they are ignored uh, for several years, they are able to finally get some, uh, some, some redress by having their homes purchased 
by the state and then partially by the federal government to get people out of there. Uh, they would bought those homes without any knowledge that it was built on a toxic waste dump. So this was something that pushed uh, the environmental movement forward. And one of the reasons why it pushes the environmental movement forward is because Love Canal leads directly to the passage of what we today call Superfund, which is the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, which is why we call it Superfund, because no one will ever remember all of those words. Basically, this is not a regulatory law. This is a law to address a problem to remove the problem, not to punish the creator of the problem. To put it as simply as possible, under the Superfund as it was created, if you are creating a product and there is toxic waste that is a known byproduct of that, you pay a small excise tax on the product you're making because we know you're making toxic waste over here. It's not making that toxic waste illegal, not saying you can't produce it, just saying you're going to pay a little bit into a fund because there's a long history of companies going bankrupt or disappearing rather than cleaning up this toxic waste that they're making over here. So this is a fund that will be there to clean up the toxic waste when the company disappears and won't do it. It is a slow process, uh, but it is a process that is working. And it is working until 1995. In 1995, again, under a Democratic administration, uh, so don't blame the Republicans for everything here. Uh, they're worse on the environment, absolutely, but they are not the, um, they are not the enemy. Um, basically, uh, exploitative capitalist uh, systems without regulation is the enemy. And in 1995, that excise tax that, that, that uh, funds the super fund is allowed to expire. And once it is allowed to expire, super fund is sitting there at that moment with almost $4 billion, which it goes through on a pretty quick, at a pretty quick rate because of the toxic waste that has been left behind. By 2003, because there is no longer a way, a mechanism to, re, to replenish that Superfund, by 2003, Superfund is out of money. So today, Superfund is replenished out of the general fund, which means that Superfund was created to put 70% of the cost of cleaning up toxic waste on the companies that produced it. Today, 70% of the cost of cleaning up that toxic waste comes from general taxpayer dollars and zero comes from the corporations that produce it. The reason that exists though is because of Lois Gibbs and the Love Canal Homeowners Association. They demanded that the federal government create a system that will remedy these legacy problems that there are no other ways to address which is the Allied Paper Company uh, Superfund site in Kalamazoo, which theoretically is finally moving forward, but even that is not being done uh, in a truly cleanup manner. All right, we're gonna skip this one because I wanna get to this last, we're just gonna go to this last one here and I'm gonna wrap up with this uh, example. This last example here, comes out of Warren County in North Carolina. And this is gonna be analogous to United Farm Workers. Yeah, and United, in that what we find is even the most vulnerable and seemingly powerless people can have power if they can organize. Going back to the very first slide, power is the organizing of money or it's the organizing of people. Either way, you can exert pressure upon the, the levers of, of, of control. And that's what power is about. In Warren County, North Carolina, the issue is a toxic waste dump. The toxic waste dump is needed because of this situation up here. 
to um, summarize it, there is a company called Ward Transformer Company. Uh, you know the transformers on telephone poles, power poles. They're filled with uh, uh, like an oil solution, and it is full of PCBs. So very um, toxic, highly contaminated oils that by 1978 are under the Resource Conservation Recovery Act of 1976. It's been on a couple of slides, but we didn't talk about it. But uh, 1976 laws are put in place to regulate the disposal of toxic waste. Before 1976, those laws didn't exist at the federal level. So they exist now. So they, they exist by 1978. So Ward Transformer Company is openly violating that law and they illegally dump uh, this PCB contaminated waste. And they, if you had any question about whether or not they knew what they're doing was terrible and illegal, just the way they do it would make it clear because they find a bunch of the most remote uh, rural county gravel roads and they dump it along the shoulder of those gravel roads. Eventually it's discovered. Once it's discovered, it is cleaned up, um, kind of. Uh, the strategy to clean it up is to create what's called a dry tomb landfill. Dry tomb landfill, in theory, is a landfill that is completely sealed up. And it, in, just by the name, it creates a dry tomb. That's the idea. As long as no liquid gets into it, the concept is that everything that's put into it will stay there in the same state that it was put in there and it will not contaminate the ground, the air, the water, or anything else. However, the um, article here that you see points out that, and this is from considerably later, it indicates that dry tomb landfills are myth they are really an engineering impossibility and they're really just a lie. And that's what this was. So from the very beginning, what we learned much later, we don't learn that the public doesn't learn this until 1994, the EPA knew right away, but the public learns that from the very beginning, there was water seeping into the bottom of this pit once water seeps into the bottom of this pit, that means that water can seep out. And you know, the water is the universal solvent, which means that it gets in there and it picks up the toxic contaminants and the PCBs that are stored and pulls them back out with it as it flows out. So it creates a really significant groundwater contamination issue. But the people in Warren County, North Carolina did not want it from the beginning. From the very first moment that they heard about it, they go to court. And in court, they spend several years fighting this, uh, but they lose. They don't win this battle in court. Uh, and one of the reasons why this ends up situated here and we see this in some documentation that comes out much later uh, about choosing a place to situate toxic waste facilities. But we do see that there are studies and there is communication from the highest level of the North Carolina government that the people in Warren County are, it's the poorest county and the highest percentage of black residents in the entire state of North Carolina, which means it is very poor and it is very black. And it is therefore in the situation, in the context of time, it is powerless, is what people believe. So it is a county that you can dump this on, no pun intended, and they're not going to be able to resist. But Warren County, North Carolina does resist. They have this lawsuit. Um, which doesn't work. They uh, are led very capably by a man named Benjamin Chavez, who will later be the head of the NAACP. And this, when that lawsuit 
fails, it leads to a really significant episode of civil unrest, um, civil disobedience. It's the largest mass action in the South since the end of the civil rights movement. Uh, over 500 people arrested. So think about that, over 500 people arrested. And the reason they're arrested is because that dry tomb landfill, which was never a dry tomb landfill, was, becomes the home for 10,000 dump truck loads filled with toxic waste. The people of Warren County, North Carolina, go to all levels of resistance to try to stop it, but they are never able to stop it. So that leads the question of why talk about this if it's not a victory? Um, what do we learn from this? How does this help us understand? One of the things it does is it shows the different techniques. So there's court cases, there's political pressure, which is not an option for the people in Warren County, North Carolina, and there's civil disobedience. Another thing that it shows is an evolution of the environmental movement and an evolution of Americans' understanding. And we can see that in this document from 1980. Uh, and first, uh, by that bottom left, that's the actual facility that we're talking about as, after it was built. Uh, but what this is, is a, uh, is a federal document produced in 1980, citing of hazardous waste landfills and their correlation with racial and economic status of surrounding communities. It is based on and closely parallels a book uh, from about the same time called Dumping in Dixie. Either one of these is a good example uh, to help you understand this situation more deeply. But what they do is after a very extensive study, demonstrate that environmental racism is a real thing and that corporations do actively choose and state governments and, and the federal government do actively choose to situate the most toxic, the most dangerous facilities among people of color and among uh, uh, people who are communities that are mostly in poverty. This shows us a lot. Uh, and this shows us that if we want to know about the environment and average Americans' ability to protect the environment and to do so through the mechanism of law. We need to very carefully and intentionally be aware of every community that's affected. Love Canal, we talked about, Love Canal was a primarily white community, but it was a working class community. Warren County, North Carolina was a very poor, very black community. Uh, we didn't talk about Times Beach, uh, Missouri, but Times Beach, Missouri is another working class white community. Uh, and so we, there, there are all these different uh, examples that we can talk about, whether it's the farmers or whether it's people in Appalachia. It is the responsibility of Americans to decide where morality and ethics and law overlap and where they're in conflict. And that's really the whole heart of it is our, our system is based upon our legal code being kept up to date with our ethical code. And morality is how we push ethics. Our personal decisions influence our social decisions, our social decisions influence our federal decisions. And then I just want to end with this, because if we're talking about law, we're talking about the legislative process, and then we're talking about the court system. But from the very first slide, you know, I mentioned that power is money, but power can be people too. 
for Americans that do not have the access to power that money provides, pressure needs to be generated through the access to power by organizing people. If we look at court decisions over time, we see that courts are also influenced by social trends. Civil disobedience that we mentioned that we talk about here. And Randy Hayes is the founder of Rainforest Action Network, which is why I have this slide down there. The Texaco kills rainforest from one of the demonstrations. One of the most um, well known of the civil disobedience driven organizations of the 80s and 90s as uh, uh, Rainforest Action Network. And this is the way that he, he conceptualized it. What you're doing with civil disobedience is trying to change culture, trying to shift society to where you are. By doing so, you create power by organizing people. As you organize people, you can then influence the creation and the implementation of law. So where I wanna leave is environmental history is unintended and unanticipated consequences. And power is money and power is people. And the only way that our legal system is kept uh, in line with our cultural beliefs and values is by average Americans demanding that it uh, stay that way. Thank you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to, free to reach out to me. Uh, my email address will be in the description for today's event. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Let me switch the view here. Okay, I'm gonna kick out your screen sharing here a bit. Stop the screen sharing. There we go. Well, I want to thank you so much for talking about this. I actually took a class on environmental racism in grad school that was really interesting. Um, and a lot of the cases that you talk about, we definitely talked about in that class too. So this, a lot of this was familiar territory for me. Uh, one of the books that we had to read that uh, semester was uh, The Garbage Wars, which talks about um, the city of Chicago and where to put landfills and the development of the garbage and sanitation kind of uh, departments in Chicago. And a lot of it does talk about environmental racism. We've got the classic focus on that. So um, I want to thank you so much for coming out today. Uh, this is, I think, a really good example of how law is, number one, not a stagnant thing. Number two, it is easy. It can be changed even if it's not the easiest thing in the world. And number three, like you said, people are power. We have the power when we get together to say no more. We want safe roads and we want safe streets and we want clean air. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't companies that sit there and said, well, we're going to stop polluting Los Angeles and, and dealing with the smog. It was residents saying, I'm not dying of cancer because of this. Um, there are several super fun area, super fun sites in the area, like in Gary and Michigan City, and of course, being near two uh, nuclear power plants between Cook Power Plant, Stevensville, and obviously the one over in um, Michigan City. It is a concern, for example, nuclear waste being put into the lake um, with the steel mills right around the corner. That was always that issue in the area. I don't, I grew up in Northwest Indiana. I've noticed whenever I, I don't live in the area anymore. I come back, I'm like, Oh, this is this is a bad smell. <laughs> I, I grew up smelling this. I think this was normal, and and so um, I do know that Michigan, Wisconsin, and Illinois banded together a few years ago to sue the state of Indiana because the downstate, if you don't really care too much about us in the region, uh, decided that they were just going to allow the steel mills and the power plants to dump more into the lake. And these three states did band together and said, "No, it's not going to happen." So. There was clearly pressure from environmental groups on these states to make a physical action that resulted in the state of being sued. I do believe that they, well, theoretically, they pulled back on those amounts, but I think we all know that these companies are secretly dumping more than they probably should be. Um, there is a lot of movement in Northwest Indiana for cleanups of sites that are not declared super fun, but have been part of industrial um, 
the industrial kind of patch there in, in Chicago and Gary. So this is a constant thing we're seeing, and it's not a surprise that East Chicago and Gary are predominantly black and brown communities. So they're, they're really fighting back. South of Chicago seeing a lot of this as well. So we within the Great Lakes state are seeing a lot of this, Milwaukee, Chicago. So we're seeing the impacts and those of us in West Michigan see the impact because everything comes in our direction. <laughs> so all the water flows in our direction, the air flows in our direction. So the impact of these communities and their changes do impact us on the back end of things. So, um, so again, thank you so much for joining us and we will have this up in a few weeks on our YouTube page. We will put Dr. Banak's information for you to reach out to him. And if you're looking for more information about environmental history, we'll have a few books and suggestions in the description. Um, but other than that, you have a wonderful weekend. And if you enjoyed this talk, come check out a few more by visiting burianhistory.org. Thank you so much.